Vladimir Putin's name is known, of course, all over the world. The name of Alexander Dugin? Not so much. But to people in the know, Alexander Dugin, a philosopher and Russian public intellectual, matters because he says what Putin thinks. Joining us now for more on the man who has been called Putin's brain, here's Michael Millerman. He is a PhD student in political science who has co-translated Alexander Dugin's fourth political theory. Michael, it's good to have you on TVO for the first time. Welcome. Thanks. Tell us off the top, why do you think it's so important to know who Dugin is to understand why Putin is doing what he's doing? Well, it's very important to know who Dugin is because he's Russia's chief ideological mastermind. So officially, Russia doesn't have an ideology. According to the Russian constitution, they're not allowed to have, a, have an ideology. But as you can see, if you listen to Putin's speeches, see what he's doing, they seem to be acting in line with some real idea about Russia's role in history and Russia's place in the world. And the source for those ideas is really Dugin's theory of Eurasianism. Eurasianism. So that underlies Putin's project of a Eurasian Union. It gives him the ideas, the arsenal for understanding Russia as a civilization. And it really informs everything he does that's of interest to the West and not really understood by the West right now. Let me follow up on Eurasianism, because if I understand that, it's, it's an idea that is sort of meant to protect Russia from encroachment of foreign powers and hostile ideas. And I wonder, where, where does this fear of foreign powers and hostile ideas, why is that so ingrained in the Russian psyche? Well, it's, it's really deeply ingrained in the Russian psyche, in this ideology and Putin's view of the world and Dugin's view of the world, that the West has never really made a satisfactory attempt to understand Russia as distinct, as, as distinct and of worth in its own right. So the West has always tried to change Russia into something that it isn't, has always tried to make it more like the West, more liberal, more democratic, more human rights, always assuming that that's the way that it has to be. That's the best way for it to be. And then Putin comes on the stage, as he did just the other day in, in his speech, and he says, we're a, we're a thousand year old civilization with our religious traditions and our holy sites and our deep um, civilizational code, and we're not going to let the West dictate to us how we need to interpret our own uh, history or our own present, and certainly not our future. So is Dugan actually opposed to the idea of Western liberal democracy? Dugan is very much opposed to the idea of Western liberal democracy. Um, on one hand, because it tries to export itself as universal to the rest of the world. It tries, to, it tries to make everybody like itself, and it does so oftentimes really rather um, violently and not very delicately. And he's also opposed to it on philosophical and religious and, and other grounds as well. Well, let's pluck one issue out of the headlines, which uh, certainly was a big deal during the Sochi Olympics as well. Uh, gay rights. Where's Dugan on that? Well, Dugan would say that the way it's currently used, the issue of homosexual rights, homosexual marriage, is really often part of a ideological propaganda war that the West wages on traditional societies. That's one way that Dugan would see it. So it's never just an issue by itself. It always belongs to this larger set of issues. And Dugan would say, look, if you want to order your marital relations in that way, if you want to understand sexual identity in that way, you're welcome to do so. But you shouldn't go around dictating to the rest of the world because they may think of marriage in completely different terms. They may think of sexual identity in completely different terms. And we have to respect those deep cultural differences. So Dugan, he's not for, you know, violence against gays in Russia. Not, not, no, not homophobic. Not, no, he's not homophobic. It's nothing like that. It's that Russia has its own traditions that need to be allowed to develop organically and properly without this imposition of the idea that gay marriage or homosexual relations are the, are, the, are the best, they're the standard, they must be respected, they must be celebrated. If the West would like to celebrate them, let the West celebrate them. That would be Dugan's position. But it's not for but Russia. If it's not for Russia. And it's, there may be other countries as well that uh, agree with him on that point. Shall we hear from the man himself? Just sure. look at the monitor over my shoulder here. And here is... The man, Alexander Dugan, you'll see the subtitles at the bottom. He speaks Russian, of course. Roll tape. Знать, что такое модерн, это не просто знать, теоретически познакомиться. Это быть в модерне. Быть в модерне, это значит обладать двумя свойствами субъекта. Это рассудком и волей. Вот этих двух вещей в нашем российском, русском обществе принципиально нет. У нас нет рассудка и воли. I just want to follow up on that very last thing he said. We have neither reason nor will. 
What does he mean by that? Yeah, so that's an interesting statement, and it's important not to misinterpret it. He's not saying that Russians don't have, that they don't have intellect, that they're not rational, that they're not reasonable. That's not what he means when he says that they don't have reason. What he means is that they have never tried to become scientifically rational as the final goal of human development. You know, in Western history, we at some point said religion is something outdated, something antiquated. It's something that's not precise enough. It's not amenable to scientific calculation and technical control. And so they tried to replace faith and a kind of belief in higher powers and things like that by this um, powerful force of reason. And what Dugan is saying is Russia never went through that tradition and they never had it become part of what it means to be a Russian person. So for a Russian person, faith is just as important as reason. It, it was never something that they erased from the picture. One way of thinking of this, if you look at um, Christian religious symbolism, you might think of the devil that rebelled against God by asserting his reason. He said, I could know everything on my own, self-assertion of his will, and that's a fallen angel. From Dugan's point of view, that describes the, the West, actually, is in that sense turned its back on God in a way that Russia never did well, and, and never should. It's interesting because, of course, sitting from the West, if we see that line, we have neither reason nor will, my hunch is our reaction will be, well, you better go get some because we're going to need that to get along in this world. They don't see it that way. Um, Dugan doesn't, doesn't see it that way. If we, un if we understand again what exactly he means by reason and will, because the people who say Russia should acquire reason and acquire will are essentially saying, again, become like the West, follow our path. We've got the way. We know where progress is moving. We know what it entails. We know why it's important. Science is the way that we should be going. Self-assertion is the way that we should be going. Get, get rid of your religious traditions. Like Putin said yesterday in his speech, he said Crimea has a sacred significance to Russia. If we invite Russia to get reason and will, we can't speak of geographical territories having sacred significance. So the invitation for Russia to acquire reason and will is really just another package of saying, be like the West, do what we do, think like we think. And of course, that's something that Dugin is very much opposed to. And it's very evident and growing increasingly more evident that Putin himself is opposed to that path and doing something really radically different. If you needed, though, any further proof that Western liberal democracy and what's going on over there are so wholly different. I mean, Putin's line about the collapse of the Soviet Union being the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century, I mean, we don't believe that. We are happy to see communism's backside. What does Dugan have to say about 70 years of an utterly failed, discredited system of being? Communism. Yeah, so that's a great question, but we have to distinguish something. We have to distinguish something very important. One thing is communist ideology, which the liberal world was happy to see go, and so was Dugan, because Dugan is an anti-communist. And Putin, if you read his 2013 speech at Valdai, also says the communist experience is no longer prop proper or suitable for us. So on all counts, we're happy to see the communist ideology buried. But Putin's statement has to do with the geopolitical catastrophe of the, of the collapse of the Soviet Union. So imagine the Soviet Union on a map of the world. And now imagine the borders of the Russian Federation, and you'll see a very radical contraction. Mm -hmm. So it's that geopolitical contraction that both Dugin and Putin see as so problematic. So if you look at that territorial space and you start from, let's say, a thousand years ago and just roll forward in time and you'll see that the borders, they pulse, they move forward, they, they contract a little bit. So it's a living territorial space geopolitically. Mm -hmm. But what happened with the collapse of the Soviet Union was that that heartbeat underwent a heart attack. It contracted so radically that the Eurasian identity, the territorial space, it really suffered a catastrophic blow. And so Dugan and Putin both think that as you get the Russian Federation back into its good shape, um, and as you have, have the Eurasian Union or regional integration increasing, you're geopolitically speaking, this is distinct from ideology, geopolitically mm -hmm. speaking, you're putting that back on its proper footing, back on, into a healthy order. Proper footing, meaning Russia needs to have control over its neighbors. Russia needs to have integration with its neighbors along civilizational, cultural commonalities. Um, and I really think that that's the underlying aim of the, of the Eurasian Union project. It's much more than just economic. It really seeks to establish that regional, cultural, civilizational identity that can be uh, not necessarily superior to, but in its own right opposed to something like the Euro European Union or NATO or U uh, United States. So it's, from a geopolitical point of view, it's, re it's returning to its health. 
Let's show some of your work here. We want to uh, read an excerpt from Dugan's fourth political theory, which you have co-translated. So, Sheldon, here we go. American values pretend to be universal ones. In reality, it is a new form of ideological aggression against the multiplicity of cultures and traditions still existing in the rest of the world. Therefore, all traditionalists should be against the West and globalization, as well as against the imperialist politics of the United States. Well, Dugan's attack on Western ideas seems primarily aimed at the United States as opposed to Western Europe. Why is he attacking American values so much and Western European values not so much? Well, Dugan sees the United States as the heart of the West, the core, the nucleus of the West right now. And while it is true that he focuses on the United States, he does also criticize those Western European states that he considers vassals of the, of the United States, that just buy into its ideology and follow its, its dictates. But he recognizes that some countries, like France and Germany, for example, they are on the fence, sort of. They do look to Russia in part for inspiration. And this is especially true of many European opposition parties today, the so-called European right or European new right. Mm -hmm. They have also this traditionalist um, orientation that is suspicious of Western liberalism. And they see Putin as the vanguard of that traditionalism. So he, he doesn't see anything like that in the United States. The United States is basically pure liberal, whereas it's a little bit more mixed in Western Europe. So he, ha he reserves his most fierce criticism for the United States as the home of the liberal idea. And the second in line are the Western European states that are basically um, you know, licking the United States boots from his point of view, really hmm. following their, uh, their lead uncritically. What does he think about Canada then? Probably doesn't think about Canada. Does yeah, he? he doesn't say too much about Canada, but as I'm sure people can't um, fail to have noticed, Harper himself has started speaking as an ideological advocate of the West more and more these days. And Putin has noticed that and Russians have noticed that. And so it may be that people begin to take some uh, criticism, direct some of the criticism that is reserved for America towards Canada as well. It's not impossible. Let's do one more excerpt from your work here. Second graphic. The future world should be characterized by multiplicity. Diversity should be taken as its richness and its treasure, and not as a reason for inevitable conflict. Many civilizations, many poles, many center, many sets of values on one planet and in one humanity. Many worlds. Now, I was interested in the use of the word diversity there. In Canada, diversity means one thing. What does he mean it to mean? Well, he means something other than what we mean by it. We mean multiculturalism, of yeah, course, we that mean kind of thing. Multiculturalism, there are all kinds of differences that are basically not something we should think critically about. We accept them, we embrace them without really digging deeply into why they, why they might matter, or how one might really have a stark contrast from the other one. We try to just include difference in this equal sameness. Let's all peacefully get around the table and the differences don't really matter. And that all happens within the context of Western civilization. So Dugan's view is rather different. He says, we have to have a real difference, real diversity, which is multi-civilizational. So you have to include the diversity of non-Western societies in your understanding of diversity. Hmm. If they follow Sharia law, they follow Sharia law. That's, that's diverse, that's different, but that's not the sort of diversity we want to admit, obviously. That's one example, one radical example, but there is a spectrum and there are many differences along that spectrum. So what he says is, don't take the Western idea of difference, multiculturalism, and imagine that it applies universally. There are real differences, differences that you can analyze, that you can judge, that have consequences. And these should be represented in a world order that is a multipolar world of many civilizations. Except that, you know this old expression, people vote with their feet. The immigration patterns are not two-way, they are overwhelmingly one-way. People come from there to come to the West because presumably they think the West has the best humanity, wealth, freedom, security as a package, it's a pretty good package. Um, how does he explain that? Well, there's, there's something to that, but that's not the whole story. So we should point out that second in line of immigration flows is actually Russia. So there are people moving into Russia who see that as a, as a hope as well. From but the West? Well, no, not necessarily not from, from the, West. the West, no. Maybe from the neighbors, but, but. From the neighbors, but I think he would say, look, the West is a, is a sort of package deal. Some people come for the business opportunities. They like the capitalistic spirit of free enterprise, but they don't buy the liberal ideology of political correctness and a certain form of uh, 
limited form of diversity. And it's, it's true that a lot of people are critical of the liberal ideology, even though they're really grateful for the wealth and the security and the opportunity to thrive as free enterprise. So those things should be distinguished. And he also thinks that, look, at the end of the day, as a matter of fact, he says somewhere in the fourth political theory that we can't imagine a world without washing machines. We're so, we're so grateful that we have our technological contrivances that we can't even imagine why anybody would live in any other way. But he says there are people who want to live in another way. There are people for whom the spiritual life or the religious life is equally as important or more important than just wealth and security. Wealth and security are goods, but in the hierarchy of human goods, they play a comparatively small role in Dugan's analysis. Okay, one last thing. Getting personal here. You ready? Where are you born? I'm, I was born in Canada. Where are your parents born? My parents were born in the former Soviet Union your in Moldova. Your parents are from the former Soviet Union. So even though they and you have clearly benefited from what I just described, voting with their feet, they emigrated to the West, have, I mean, I presume you are embracing the sort of liberal democratic values and vision of the West. Uh, are you a little distressed personally with Dugan's positions? People sometimes ask me when they hear that I study Dugan, you know, how could you be interested in anti-liberalism in the way that you are? And you know, I'm, if I really thought that it was, you know, I embrace Dugan's positions for the following reason. I'm grateful for the freedoms that the liberal world offers, but I do think that its understanding of history, its understanding of humanity is unnecessarily limited. And it's not just unnecessarily limited, it really, we pay a very high price for that, for that understanding of humanity. We miss out on a real richness of the human experience. And something I really admire about Dugan, I really do admire this about Dugan, is that he brings out the whole richness of the human experience. Its rational side, its mystical side, its psychological, sociological, historical side. He's not willing to say, let the West be the end of the story. No, the story is actually much more complicated, much more beautiful. It's what one Russian called a uh, blossoming complexity. I really think that's what human life is. So if you can have both at once, both what liberalism gives us that's good and enrich its understanding of human life and human affairs so that it doesn't flat everything out to the lowest common denominator, you really have the best possible solution. And I find Dugan to be a great aid in that project for us. I totally get that. Having said that, neither you nor your parents want to go back. Right? Well, I've never been there, so there's not even talk about going back for me. I would, I would love to go have a chance to, have a chance to visit Moscow State University, study, um, meet um, um, Professor Dugan, Mr. Dugan himself. And um, you don't as for my parents, I'll, I'll have to wait to let them speak for themselves. <laughs> my guess is you don't want to move to Moldova, though. <laughs> like I said, I'd like the opportunity to study <laughs> okay, in Moscow as, as far as moving there. It's, it's really the, the ideas and the understanding that, that matters to me. I'm not eager in a rush to get out of Canada. That's certainly not the issue. But you try to understand what's happening in the world and your place in it. And I, I find Dugan to be a really helpful guide in that, in that project. And you've been an extremely helpful guide getting us inside Putin's brain. Uh, this was most illuminating. Michael Millerman, PhD student, Poli Sci, University of Toronto. Thanks so much. Thank you. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.